Hi, this is Julie, and I'm excited to share this first new episode of 2023. Before we begin, I want to invite you to one of my favorite New Year traditions. It's a Spark Your Epic Year workshop in the form of a reflective virtual milestone hike that will help us pack up the learning from the year that has ended and set intentions for the one ahead. No sweating required since we'll be in the comfort of our own home. To learn more and sign up, visit tinyurl.com slash sparkyourepicyear23. Spaces are limited, and I hope you will claim one. Now, on to the show. Hi, and welcome to Mother's Quest, a podcast for moms like me ready to live our own truly epic life. I'm Julie Neal, a life and leadership coach, community builder, writer, and mom to two high-energy boys who challenge me to grow into my best self. Where was I? In 2016, on a leap of faith, I signed up for something called a power circle and was guided through a six-month process by this amazing facilitator, Jamie Greenwood. In the space that Jamie held for a small group of us, I set out loud my dreams for Mother's Quest for the first time. And at Jamie's urging, started a Facebook group for the community I hoped to grow. Six plus years, almost 100 podcast episodes, and over a 1,000 Facebook group members later in my journey, Jamie has become a mother herself and has evolved her coaching practice into one that teaches big dreaming, high achieving women, many of them mothers, how to set boundaries and find home within ourselves without an ounce of guilt. To close out this introduction, I'm honored to introduce empathy advocate, author, and fellow podcaster, Maria Roth who I met through Jamie with this episode's beautiful dedication. Here's Maria. Hello, I'm Maria Ross, speaker, author, podcast host of the Empathy Edge podcast, an empathy advocate who shows progressive people-centric organizations and leaders how to achieve radical success through empathy. And I'm honored to dedicate this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast to Julie Neal herself for creating this space and all of you moms struggling to raise joyful, resilient, healthy humans while also finding time for your own passion and purpose. Today's guest, Jamie Greenwood, is my dear friend and a woman's coach for big dreaming, ambitious women. And today she'll talk about the constant push-pull we all feel when balancing passion and purpose with the needs of our family. Jamie and I have known each other since before we both had children, hit it off immediately when we first met and have supported each other through the crazy twin roller coasters of motherhood and entrepreneurship. It's so important to find those people who understand you, empathize with you, and support you. In fact, entrepreneurship and motherhood have a lot in common. They're both hard work, full of joy, big dreams, long nights, heartbreaking challenges, and neither is ever what you expected at the beginning. It takes a lot of bravery to watch your baby, be it your actual child or your work, fall down, get up, evolve, and adapt. They both take resilience, courage, and a community to support you through it all. Jamie shares transformative personal development insights, not in some sanitized Instagram-ready way, but for those of us living in the real world of defiant and screaming kids, overwhelming demands, fear of failure, and constant chaos. It's been a joy to watch Jamie embrace and amplify her gifts over the years, to not only coach individuals and corporate leaders, but create safe spaces for women just like you and me who want to lead rich, nourishing, aligned lives. When you meet Jamie, she will have a profound impact on you. Jamie's not afraid to be vulnerable and helps us all embrace our vulnerability to find strength to move forward. I've learned so much from Jamie about self-compassion and setting boundaries because she shares the journey with you. So settle in, grab a beverage or your walking shoes, and get ready to enjoy the feisty and loving light that is Jamie Greenwood. Jamie, welcome to the Mother's Quest podcast. You're just what I need today. I'm so happy to have this conversation with you. Thank you. I think it's what I need today, too. (laughs) I do love the chat before the actual 
pressing recording on every episode and you and I were finding ourselves in a similar place and it feels like we should definitely bring it in to today's conversation. So before I ask you the first question I ask every guest, I want to just name that you and I are both going through a really hard time in our motherhood and life journey and balancing the two. Yes, we were just talking about kids and illness and just the idea that as a mother who has passion and drive, the minute you seem to get any traction, someone gets sick and you have to stop that traction, that direction and move in a completely different one to take care of your family. Yeah. And for me, it's someone is sick or there might be mental health challenges or in the case of my youngest now, he's in a boot for the third time since June. It could be an array of things that call us to have to press pause on a lot of the things that are on our passionate and purposeful to-do list, priority list. And it can be really frustrating. Yes. You said earlier, like things hadn't necessarily worked out the way you wanted to, but it was good because it opened up space for you to care for your family. That is what I try and do is When I want to move in one direction and I find that I can't because of family responsibilities, I try and find like, it's okay because they need me and I need to be doing this. And it also brings me back to like, what matters most to me. And yes, my passion and my purpose mean something to me a lot, but I think family is, is always number one. And so I'm having to navigate my disappointment around purpose and passion when it's number two, it's a high number two, but it's number two, not number one. Yeah. And As the words fell out of my mouth (laughs) about my frustration, I'm also aware of number one, how grateful I am that I have the flexibility to be able to shuffle things so that I can be present for my kids. And that was really what Mother's Quest was all about to begin with. And number two, I just came back from traveling to Las Vegas for a three-day speaker certification training with a fellow podcast guest who you know, Lex Vernon. So even though there have been a lot of things I've had to pause or say no to, I did say yes to myself for that and thankfully have a support system here at home with my partner, Chris, where I was able to do that. So speaking out loud about all of this, I feel like I can go to some black and white thinking even myself. And I'm realizing that I have been able to make space for both things recently, even though it's been challenging. Yes. All right. That's a little premise. I'm sure it's going to weave in through some more of our questions as we go. But if you're listening and you're relating and nodding your head, I hope this conversation will be as much for you as it is for us. So first question, Jamie, that I love to ask every guest, tell me a little bit about your own childhood and the impact that your mom had in shaping who you are today. Oh, (laughs) I've been, ever since you sent me that question, I've really been sitting with it. You know, it reminds me of the Krista Tippett question of like, tell you about the spiritual upbringing of your family. (laughs) You know, my mother, how do I say this? There were a lot of adults in my world growing up. There were my parents, there were my grandparents, there was my aunt, but my mother was really the strong and primary source of unconditional love in that world. And so I learned a lot from her. I think I was never not near her because she was such a shining source of love for all of us. I have a sister and a brother and all three of us just kind of hung on her. You know, now I'm thinking like, oh, my children hang on me. But how I just hung on my mother to be near that love and to be near that light. And she taught me about kindness. She taught me about care. She taught me about sacrifice. And what's interesting is that I then kind of noticed or looking back as a young adult, especially sacrifice, I saw my mother sacrificing a lot. And what I thought that meant and kind of the elevation of sacrifice in my own life until it really no longer was working for me. That's kind of my mom. She's an incredible human being and the best grandma ever. I love that. Well, of course, as you named these things that you experienced in your mom, I see so many of them in you. And I have really appreciated the way that you have brought the concept of motherhood and our inclination to feel like we need to sacrifice ourselves to the conversation. You speak about it so clearly and powerfully. And I've really seen how you help not only me, but other moms realize that while there might be moments of sacrifice, 
that we have to put ourselves front and center. And I love the language that you use around homecoming. So that might be a good opportunity to move into this next question, which is I'd love to know what you're most on a quest for in your life now. And if you can tell me a little bit more about this idea of homecoming and what it means to you and how that has become part of your journey. Thank you. I named my group coaching program Homecoming because it's what I have been working towards for the last 25 years, which is a sense of home in myself, home in my decisions, home in my body, home in my beliefs, home in what I care most about. Not everyone feels the same way about home, but when I say home, I mean a sense of solidity and groundedness and a foundational strength that is unwavering and unshakable. And part of sacrifice, there is not a parent who, and particularly mothers, who is not going to be asked to sacrifice on a daily basis. I recently thought to myself, will I ever get my way again? <laughs> like, <laughs> will I ever get to do what I want to do again? Like a perfect example where I choose not to sacrifice is my children are young. They're four and five and a half. And so they're just a constant desire for things and for asking. And, you know, I'll be making them breakfast and they want breakfast and then they want water and then they want apple and now they want a scoop of peanut butter. And what I do is after I give them their initial food and they start asking for more, I'll say, you know what? I can help you in a moment, but mom is going to feed herself first because I need to take care of myself. And so, I mean, I say that every single day because every day they keep asking for more food because I want them to know that I count too, that I'm not going to sacrifice my hunger because I'm also hungry in the morning to make sure that they have every single need met before I meet my own. I take care of their primary need, which is a bowl of oatmeal, and then I'm going to feed myself. It's so powerful that you do that, of course, for yourself, but also because of what you're modeling for your children about what it means to be a mother and what it means to be a human who cares about their own well-being. Has that always been true for you? Does it come naturally to you? I'm thinking to myself as I'm hearing you, wow, what an important thing to say. I should say that more often. What's stopping me from doing that? How did this become part of your daily being to share this yeah. with them? Well, going back to seeing my mother sacrifice over and over and over again, I found myself very angry a lot as a child, feeling this is so unfair. This dynamic in our family where mom is working herself to the bone and none of us you know, are really helping. It's not fair. And so while I knew that it wasn't fair, in my first marriage, I found myself just sacrificing and sacrificing. I did not have children with that partner, but I was compromising myself over and over again because that's what I thought needed to happen. The issue, though, was that I was also angry most of the time, that the more I sacrificed, the more resentful I became. And the more I sacrificed, the more I lost contact with myself, with who I was and am. And so in getting a divorce and in falling in love and having a partner and now having a family, I just, one, I didn't want to bring that anger and rage into my family. And I also knew the only way that was not going to be there was if I remembered myself and I remembered my needs. And I remembered that I can't be everything to everyone, but I can give some to them and then I can give some to me and I can give some to them and I can give some to me. I talk about this a lot in my work around boundaries. Like this is really a boundary issue because children and often partners and family <laughs> and other people in our lives are going to ask and ask and ask and ask. And they aren't going to remember us. We have to remember us. Boundary is another word that I feel like I am still trying to completely get my hands around. What is your definition of boundary? I really love the Prentice Hemphill definition, which is a boundary is the safe distance at which I can love you and myself simultaneously. Oh, wow. It's the safe distance at which I can love you and myself simultaneously. Because it's such a brilliant statement. And I love it because it brings in love. Oftentimes we think about boundaries as like hard and fast and firm and no one crosses a boundary. And it's like, actually, these things are in place, not as walls, but as ways to actually allow us to connect and love each other better. It is actually not a loving experience for me to always say yes to you and always say no to myself. That is not a loving 
experience. That's an uneven experience. And so that's how I think about boundaries. How do we place boundaries that are kind, loving, compassionate, that allow you something and also bring me into the equation as well? I want to keep building on this as we move into what I call the epic guideposts. You, Jamie, have actually been there for the Mother's Quest journey almost from the first moment of inception because you were my coach in the circle when I named what I was trying to create for the first time in front of other people. And you helped to get me clear and cheer me on and create a community at the time where I could dream out loud. So first of all, thank you for that incredible part that you played. I know you know that Epic is both a metaphor for being the author of our story and saying yes to our own hero's journey. And then it's also a set of guideposts that I think help us to live a life where we are the author of our story while we're raising our kids and a life filled with the things that matter most to us. So the first guidepost E, which I'd love to hear more about from you, is about engaging mindfully with our kids. And you've already started to share some of how you do that. I'd love to hear more about more examples of how boundaries show up and how you engage mindfully with your two daughters. Well, they're young and they require a lot right now and not only a lot in all ways. And one of the boundaries I have to kind of set possibly 15 times a day is around my body. My four-year-old still likes to say that she is a baby and likes to do skin to skin. She like come up to me, pull up her shirt and smash her body against my body. (laughs) Now, most of the time I love it, but it's not always appropriate. I don't want her pulling up my shirt when we have people over. And I live in Berkeley where there's definitely a theme around parenting around just letting your children, you know, you never want to say no to your child. And like, no, I will be saying no to that. I will be saying no to her undressing me in front of our guests. So one of the gentle boundaries I hold with her is there's a time for that. We can do belly to belly every morning, but we're not going to do it in the afternoon. And she might yell, she might cry, she might hit me. She wants what she wants, but it's my job to hold it and to remind her that my body matters too. Not just her desire. I validate her desire. I know what you want, but it's just not going to happen right now. Part of the mindfulness is just trying to be as present as I can with my children in all of their stages of feeling. When they're happy, being present when they're happy. When they're mad, trying to stay present when they're mad and not personalizing it or deciding like, I'm wrong. Or maybe I should just give her what she wants all the time. And another way that I've been engaging mindfully with my children has to do with repair and healing. I'm not always in charge of my big feelings and my emotions. I do get angry. And so if I yell or if I become rough with my children, allowing there to be space for repair. And whether that means I circle back and say, you know, that thing that happened yesterday, are you open to talking about it? Or my older child, who's five and a half, she is the queen of circling back and repair. Like the other day, she was like, mama, I want to do an I statement with you. I was like, oh my God. She's like, I did not like what you did yesterday. I was like, I know. I am sorry that that happened. You know, we went this whole thing. It was like narrative therapy. I was like, how would you have liked it to go? And so Mm. she told me. And then we played out that scenario and how she would have liked it to go. That's amazing. It was amazing. And it was so healing for both of us. You know, for me saying like, how would you have liked it to be? She's like, I wanted it this way. And then we do it. It's like all of my fear that I have now traumatized my child, you know, like melts away a little bit because she is now the author of her own story. And so much of our children's pain and our own pain from childhood is around kind of the loss of power. Mm -hmm. And part of being mindful with my children is finding ways to empower or re-empower them. You know, she and I got into a fight. She felt very disempowered. And so the next day in circling back, I do everything I can to make her feel powerful. She is the author of this story instead of being a victim of my anger or whatever it was. I love these examples. And it also reminds me of how incredible it is when we are thoughtful and mindful about how we want to be as a mother with our kids. And then we see the impact of that when they come back with something like what your daughter did. Julie, I almost died. I almost died. 
I have an I statement for you. I'm like, I can't. I'm so happy. I can't even see straight. Amazing. This is reminding me of something that happened two nights ago. The first night that I was back with Jacob from my trip, which was a vocal empowerment speaking certification program. And one of the exercises we did, it was you know kind of an energizer, icebreaker kind of thing was in the circle, we took turns naming, it ain't right. And we would all just name things that we didn't feel like were right, either in our own lives, for ourselves, things that were bothering us, things in society. So I came back and during dinner, I thought Jake and I were alone having dinner together. Let's take turns doing this. I'd love to hear what comes up for him. And the very first thing he said was, it ain't right that I don't have the power to make decisions about what I want to do. Fair enough. You know, being a child is tough. And I feel like, though, that is an opening for more conversation about where can we give you more power or where do you already have power? And a reminder for me about what it feels like for him. I love this reminder about being an authentic conversation. And in both cases, you know, my son's 10, your daughter's five, and they're capable of complex, deep thinking. Yes. Amazing. Okay. The next guidepost P stands for purposeful and passionate. And this is about the impact that we want to make in the world beyond our family. Where are you most wanting to make an impact these days? And what are some of the lessons that you've been learning along the way? I originally started out as a health coach, helping people take better care of their bodies. And that moved into life coaching and that moved into leadership coaching. And the theme through all of it is self-care. I am insane for self-care and teaching women how to care for ourselves in the ways that we need and in the ways that kind of, again, re-empower us to do the things that we want to do in our lives. One of the forms of self-care that I love the most is this idea of saying what's true. I think that saying what is true is a form of self-care. And yet I think most of us, many of us do what I call gratitude bypasses. Instead of saying what's true, we just remind ourselves that we are so lucky for X, Y, and Z. I shouldn't call my mother out on this statement, even though it deeply hurt me and impacted my children, because she's so lovely. She's generally so lovely, and I'm lucky to have her. We use gratitude as a way of getting out of the scary thing that we actually should say, which would bring us closer to that person. And we don't believe it'll bring us closer to that person. We believe that if we say something true that scares us, it might scare the other person. And sometimes that does happen. But sometimes the truth is not only what sets us free, but it's what allows us to be seen by another person to bring them closer. I'm feeling like this is coming back to that beautiful definition you shared about boundary. Yes. It seems like in the truth telling, that's part of how you can create safety. Yeah. The language of speaking your truth is, I mean, in the coaching world, we hear it all the time. But I think for like people that aren't in the coaching world, it doesn't mean a lot. And so really, it's just about how do we not use a gratitude bypass? How do we not smother ourselves and everyone around us with gratitude for the littlest things? Because we don't want to be uncomfortable in saying something that would actually benefit everyone involved. And boundaries are a really good place to start. Boundaries are both internal and external. They happen inside of us. Usually before we can even state a boundary, we have to calm our nervous system because we're so freaked out about stating a boundary, we can't even let it fall out of our face. We have to first really calm and tend to our system so that we feel strong enough and resilient enough to let the scary thing be said. What are some of the tools and practices that you have found to be effective to help us with all of these things that you've been talking about? That is a great question. The first is actually really simple, which is just somatic awareness, meaning soma, the body, awareness, understanding and noticing what's happening in ourselves. So often ask clients to just, you know, bring up an issue that feels not super intense, but, you know, a little sticky, a little spicy. And think about the boundary you would like to set. And now imagine yourself doing that. And as you imagine yourself doing that, notice what's happening in your body. Are you sweating? Are you suddenly warm? Do you have butterflies in your stomach? Have you gone completely numb? 
all of these things are very helpful in understanding what our body does when we need to set a boundary or are scared to set a boundary. And so what we do then is build up some resourcing. I do this to this day before I have to set a scary boundary. I mean, there are boundaries that I set every day that I am not scared at all to set, but there are some that terrify me. And so when I feel in my body that suddenly for me, I immediately start sweating under my armpits. My head might start to feel a little floaty, almost like I'm out of my body. I will put a hand on my heart, a hand on my belly. Yeah. And I just do some deep breathing. And one of the things that I need to hear that reminds me of my strength is I say to myself, you're okay. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. And so sometimes that phrase really resonates with the client. Sometimes we work on what is the phrase that will remind them that they are cared for, they are loved, someone has their back. Because when I say to myself, I'm not going anywhere, I'm pretty strong. I'm incredibly badass. Like I want myself at my own back. And oftentimes when we can remember who we are at our strongest, we would absolutely want to have ourselves at our own back. Absolutely. I noticed that as you were doing that, I was just doing that for myself and I could feel a sense of calm and a sense of knowing come in. I think I mentioned to you, it's been a challenging time with both of my kids. My college age student is home with mono and he has been for three weeks. And my 10 year old who's incredibly active is in a boot for the third time since June. And we just found out today he has to go for an MRI to see if there's something more serious happening with his knee. And, you know, I could just feel my whole self. I think I feel it as like a tightening. I just feel like the walls are closing in. And some of it is like my fear and concern about my kids. And then some of it is about my fear and concern for myself. About how am I going to be able to handle all this and also still care for myself and care for the things that matter to me? So even just in this minute that you had me put my hand on my heart and take some breaths, I not only felt more connected to myself, like, okay, I'm here, I've got this. But I also feel like I'll be in a much better place to create that sense of security for my kids. Yes. So bringing that safety and security back to your children only happens when we have been able to resource ourselves first. And resourcing doesn't have to be complicated. You know, we just did it. It's breathing and remembering something that is true about ourselves. Mm. We've already begun to move into the next guidepost, I, which stands for invested in ourself. And this is the guidepost that includes self-care. I love this reminder that it doesn't have to be complicated. What are some other ways that you invest in yourself? I try and help my clients figure out the quickest thing that reconnects them to themselves. So for some people, it's being out in nature. For others, it's painting. For others, it's just being in a quiet room and knitting. For me, it's dance. And it's not enough to just put on music in the car and try and wiggle myself in my seat. I need to be in a room with music pumping and like shaking and shaking and thrashing and just really moving like an animal, like a wild animal. That reconnects me to myself within two minutes. It doesn't have to be a 50 minute dance class. It just has to be me moving in a way that is completely and utterly free without fear, without shame, without worrying about what other people think, just moving from the essence in my bones. And I have started doing that again. I'm a very physically active person. I exercise a lot, but exercise does not feed my soul. I exercise because I like to be strong, but exercise does not feed me the way that dance does. And so I was noticing that it's been like a month since I've done any dancing. And so this last week, instead of exercising, I've been dancing, which is exercise, by the way, but I've been dancing and I have felt like a superwoman, even though I've been at home with sick children, because it just so quickly gets me back into who I am, what I care about, and how I want to feel. I want to feel free and wild and untamed. Mm. 
But it's very hard to feel that way when I am in my mother role, in my worker role, in my partner role, in my daughter role. So I have to be in my free Jamie role for like a few minutes a day to really be able to fully inhabit all the other ones. I love this. And I've had the privilege of being in a workshop that you led where at one point you invited us all to dance. And I think for some of us, there's this like initial feeling of I'm going to dance in front of these people for those of us where dance is not our go-to. But within a few minutes, it was actually so much fun to -hmm. just not worry and just move. And you're right. It was such an instant energizer and instant way to shift and sort of get out of our thoughts and into our body. Yes. This conversation is also reminding me of a recent episode I recorded for someone else's podcast. It's called the Moms Don't Have Time to Move and Shake podcast. And I did a solo cast that I titled Dear Body. And I reflected on times in my life when I felt the most connected and empowered in my body. And noticed what were the things I was doing that helped me to feel that way and then made a commitment to myself to do more of those things. I'm really appreciating how that reflective experience of creating that podcast was an opportunity for me to remember. And one of the things that I wrote in a letter to myself at the end was that I have a reverence for, it was an appreciation for this knowledge that I already know what I need. It's like the instructions are inside us, but it does take a slowing down, I think, to reconnect to this record that we have inside ourselves about what works. 100%. I think we often know what we need, but we aren't in a position to be slow enough or quiet enough to hear those needs. What else have you found both in your own practice and in working with others helps us to slow down and to really listen to ourselves. I'm a little nervous to say this, but really it's about time. We have to make the time to do it. And we have to make the time to be quiet and go inside without distraction, which is almost impossible, I think, these days as a mother. Because even if our children are in school, we've got Instagram, you know, like we got a phone that can take us into all these different worlds that can keep us away from what might be an uncomfortable exploration with silence. Making time to go in is not always butterflies and ice cream. Sometimes you find some yucky stuff and you're like, ugh, now what do I do with this? (laughs) You know, like it's just so much easier to not. But every time we have a desire for something, that needs exploration, and we don't say yes to it, we are paying a price. Really curious at the start of that, you said that you were nervous to say it. What about this conversation made you nervous? Well, it feels a little cliche to be like, well, you just need to make time. Mm. Come on, ladies, put in your calendar, commit. That's not where this is coming from. You know, that is not my intention. But being quiet is not going to happen on its own. It is not a cultural value. We are not told that today's going to be your quiet day. No, everyone's like, what have you done today? How much have you done today? So it really takes bravery to carve out the time to be quiet, to hear the wisdom that is, as you said, already inside of you. There's so much wisdom already inside of us, but it can't break through the Instagram noise. It just can't. Yeah. And have you found any strategies that work for you? Yes. I Even around in- something like Instagram. I took Instagram off my phone. I haven't been on it for two months. Mm. And part of the reason, besides it bringing me zero joy, was it kept me in a very fast paced, spinning mind. And if we're going back to the first guidepost of engaging mindfully, it is very hard for me personally to engage mindfully when my mind is also spinning after being on Instagram a few times a day. And I was noticing, going back to somatic awareness, I was noticing how I felt after being on Instagram. I felt disoriented. I felt a little confused. I couldn't remember what I was doing before I had hopped on Instagram. 
man, this thing is really messing up my day and my flow. I have no flow. My day was like basically just a little bit of work, Instagram, a little bit of work, Instagram, feed the kids, pick up the kids, Instagram, you know, and it's not like I was on it for hours, but even 10 minutes would derail me for the next 40. Yeah, I'm nodding over here and have found a similar experience for myself. For me, it tends to be more Facebook, but it's the same kind of draw, you know, that takes you just down this road of distraction. But it's interesting because I noticed how much you were showing up on Instagram in terms of bringing your message. Yes. And so what has been the impact for you in terms of a way to communicate or reach people in taking it off entirely? Well, that's what I'm currently rethinking. Instagram, I had been encouraged to create a bigger presence on Instagram, which I spent almost two years doing. And there is some incredible content that I have put out on Instagram. But the combination of one, it not bringing me any joy, two, feeling like I was just throwing very important gold into the ether, you know, like, why am I putting all this stuff? Like, this is so much work every single month and actually quite expensive too. What am I doing this for? Because I'm not actually seeing a return on my business. You know, it'd be one thing if in putting up a post, it actually generated clients or a bigger following, but it, it did not. So now instead of Instagram, I am focused more on podcasts, being on podcasts, running my own podcast, which is called The Path Home and doing things that actually feel substantial to me. Like this conversation is incredibly substantial. Nothing I ever did on Instagram felt substantial. It felt like mist blowing the wind. There was no heft to it. Well, as somebody who witnessed you showing up and sharing so much that I felt was very meaningful, I want to acknowledge that sometimes you don't know what somebody's receiving, which is incredibly frustrating. <laughs> this is a way and a little bit of an acknowledgement just to tell you that what you share matters. And then I trust that it has impacted more people than you realize. And at the same time, I also acknowledge your consciousness and thoughtfulness to notice that it wasn't feeling good and that there are more meaningful ways for you to share what you're learning and what you know, and what you think can help others. I feel like that is an invitation for me to keep paying attention to that question for myself too. Thank you for going there. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, I talk a lot about shoulds in my work and all the shoulds that we find ourselves doing and what shoulds feel like in our body. And I just was finding that Instagram was becoming a huge should that felt terrible. There's got to be a better way. I'm the queen of my castle. Like, I don't have to do this. I'm in charge of my own business. Like, I can find a different way to build. It doesn't have to be this way. Okay, well, we went down a little bit of a detour, but it's one that I trust is going to resonate for a lot of people. And I know it really helped me. The last guidepost C is about connecting to a strong support network. But I also want to invite you to think about a challenge that you might want to give to me or anybody listening that can help us more fully live our epic lives. So maybe there's an integration between the two. I would love to know what comes up for you when you think both about connecting so you remember you're not alone on this journey and what you think could most fully help us come home to ourselves. Part of connecting is about bravery, really being brave in reaching out to people for support or even just reach out to people for connection. I have in the last, you know, thank you, COVID, feeling very like, where are my people? Where are my friends? You know? And just in the last few weeks, I was like, all right, enough of this feeling. I'm going to reach out to some moms that I've seen at drop off and pick up. And I'm going to say, ladies, let's go out to dinner. And we went out to dinner last night and we had so much mm -hmm. fun. And that's not something that I would normally do. I don't know these women that well. I don't know what kind of food they like to eat. I was feeling very insecure. Like, am I allowed to do this? They're kind of like strangers. But I had a desire for connection. And we have kids the same age. And it was so lovely. At the end, they both thanked me for doing it. And they asked if we could have dinner again. And it just felt like, oh my gosh, I just built instant community. I now can call these women. I feel like I could call them anytime. And it was all because I was brave enough to do it and not get into my own head about they're busy. 
they have full lives. No, if I have a hunger for something, I'm sure there's someone else that has the same hunger. I love that. And I really pay attention when I feel like signs keep coming to me. I released an episode today at the time of our recording with Jada Selner, who I, I know you know, and her challenge was also around bravery, but it was a little bit more in the professional setting to be brave about reaching out to somebody, maybe a thought leader or someone who has impacted you and letting them know, or somebody in your work sphere that you'd like to maybe build a deeper relationship with or partner with in some way. I feel like this is an extension of that, which is bravery, but also showing up in the relationships around you in your own life and where you live. So yes. I accept that challenge. My wheels are already turning and I feel like it's an invitation for me to ask that question of what kind of connection am I hungry for in my relationships and my friendships and in my own community? Yeah, you're welcome. And I will just say that's the question I asked myself. And the reason why I chose these two women was because from my small interactions from them, they were both really funny. And I was like, you know what? I want to laugh. I have not laughed so hard till I cried. It's just been too long. And so I just took a chance. I was like, I think they're funny. Let's go out. We laughed all night. That's amazing. Ah, well, I noticed that I'm smiling. I feel <laughs> just a sense of connection and relief. Everything that we talked about is just reminding me to slow down, to pay attention to what my body's telling me, to trust myself, to connect to what I'm hungry for. And to be brave enough to say it out loud. So I want to thank you for the incredible insight that you have, for the language that you use, and for the example that you set, which I know is going to help me, but I, I hope it will also help a lot of other people too. Thank you. It's such an honor to talk to you, Julie. What are you leaving this conversation with in terms of a different level of insight or a recommitment? to something that you've known. I love what you said about the wisdom is inside of me. I've actually said those words at other times, but I haven't said them or thought them in a long time. So I'm taking that. It's all there. You just need to kind of dust off, <laughs> dust off some stuff. It's right there. Thank you, Jamie. I hope that all of our kids are on the path to healing and recovery soon. And that there's more spaciousness for us to do the things that we love, but also that we can remember when times feel hard, that there's so much that we can tap into to help us stay present, to help us reach out to others, to help us continue to feel like we can be home within ourselves. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast. I hope this conversation sparked something that will help you live your epic life. If you'd like to get show notes and learn more about how to join the Mother's Quest community, visit mothersquest.com. And while you're there, I would love it if you would follow the prompts to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, and help us to spread the word. I want to end with some words to help light the way on your quest. Seize the day. Love your people. Honor your gifts. Until next time.